My dear brothers and sisters, the purpose of my message is to honor and celebrate what the Lord has done and is doing to serve the poor and the needy among his children on earth. He loves his children in need and also those who want to help, and he has created ways to bless both those who need help and those who will give it. Our Heavenly Father hears the prayers of his children across the earth, pleading for food to eat, clothes to cover their bodies, and for the dignity that would come from being able to provide for themselves. Those pleas have reached him since he placed men and women on the earth. You learn of those needs where you live and from across the world. Your heart is often stirred with feelings of sympathy. When you meet someone struggling to find employment, you feel that desire to help. You feel it when you go into the home of a widow and see that she has no food. You feel it when you see photographs of crying children sitting in the ruins of their home, destroyed by an earthquake or by fire. Because the Lord hears their cries and feels your deep compassion for them, he has from the beginning of time provided ways for his disciples to help. He has invited his children to consecrate their time, their means, and themselves to join with him in serving others. His way of helping has at times been called living the law of consecration. In another period, his way was called the united order. In our time, it is called the church welfare program. The names and details of operation are changed to fit the needs and conditions of people, but always the Lord's way to help those in need, in temporal need, requires people who, out of love, have consecrated themselves and what they have to God and to His Word. He has invited and commanded us to participate in His work to lift up those in need. We have a covenant to do that in the waters of baptism and in the holy temples of God. We renew the covenant on Sundays when we partake of the sacrament. My purpose today is to describe some of the opportunities he has provided for us to help others in need. I cannot speak of them all in our brief time together, but my hope is to renew and strengthen your commitment to act. There is a hymn about the Lord's invitation to this work that I have sung since I was a little boy. In my childhood, I paid more attention, attention to the happy tune than to the power of the words. I pray that you will feel the lyrics in your hearts today. Let's listen to the words again. Have I done any good in the world today? Have I helped anyone in need? Have I cheered up the sad and made someone feel glad? If not, I have failed indeed. Has anyone's burden been lighter today? Because I was willing to share, have the sick and the weary been helped on their way? When they needed my help, was I there? Then wake up and do something more than dream of your mansion above. Doing good is a pleasure a joy beyond measure, a blessing of duty and love. The Lord regularly sends wake-up calls to all of us. Sometimes it may be a sudden feeling of sympathy for someone in need. A father may have felt it when he saw a child fall and scrape a knee. A mother may have felt it when she heard the frightened cry of her child in the night. A son or a daughter may have felt sympathy for someone who seems sad or afraid at school. All of us have been touched with feelings of sympathy for others we don't even know. 
For instance, as you heard reports of the waves rushing across the Pacific after the earthquake in Japan, you felt concern for those who might be hurt. Feelings of sympathy came to thousands of you who learned of the flooding in Queensland, Australia. The news reports were mainly estimates of numbers of those in need, but many of you felt the pain of the people. The wake-up call was answered by 1,500 or more church member volunteers in Australia who came to help and to comfort. They turned their feelings of sympathy into a decision to act on their covenants. I have seen the blessings that come to the person in need who receives help and to the person who seizes the opportunity to give it. Wise parents see in every need of others a way to bring blessings into the lives of their sons and daughters. Three children recently carried containers holding a delicious dinner to our front door. Their parents knew that we needed help, and they included their children in the opportunity to serve us. The parents blessed our family by their generous service, by their choice to let their children participate in the giving. They extended blessings to their grandchildren. The smiles of the children as they left our home made me confident that that will happen. They will tell their children of the joy they felt giving kindly service for the Lord. I remember that feeling of quiet satisfaction from childhood as I pulled weeds for a neighbor at my father's invitation. Whenever I am invited to be a giver, I remember and believe the hymn, Sweet is the work, my God, my King. I know those lyrics were written to describe the joy that comes from worshiping the Lord on the Sabbath, but those children with the food at our door were feeling on a weekday the joy of doing the Lord's work. And their parents, the father was waiting outside, by the way, so as to be invisible. They saw the opportunity to do good and spread joy over generations. The Lord's way of caring for the needy provides another opportunity for parents to bless their children. I saw it in a chapel one Sunday. A small child handed the bishop his family's donation envelope as he entered the chapel before the sacrament meeting. I knew the family and the boy. The family had just learned of someone in the ward in need. The boy's father had said something like this to the child as he placed a more generous fast offering than usual in the envelope. Quote, we fasted today and prayed for those in need. Please give this envelope to the bishop for us. I know that he will give it to help those with greater needs than ours. Instead of any hunger pains on that Sunday, the boy will remember the day with a warm glow. I could tell from his smile and the way he held the envelope so tightly that he, that he felt the great trust of his father to carry the family offering for the poor. He will remember that day when he is a deacon and perhaps forever. I saw that same happiness in the faces of people who helped for the Lord in Idaho years ago. ago. The Teton Dam burst on Saturday, June 5, 1966. Eleven people were killed. Thousands had to leave their homes in a few hours. Some homes were washed away, and hundreds of dwellings could only be made habitable through effort and means far beyond the owners. Those who heard of the tragedy felt sympathy, and some felt the call to do good. Neighbors, bishops, Relief Society presidents, quorum leaders, home teachers, and visiting teachers left homes and jobs to clean out the flooded houses of others. One couple, one couple returned to Rexburg from a vacation just after the flood. They didn't go to see their own house. Instead, they found their bishop 
to ask where they